Welcome to the Inside Scoop. And today I have Antesa Jensen with me, who is an emotional intelligence expert. Please tell us more, Antesa, what does that mean? Hi. Um, well, emotional intelligence expert is, uh, I guess, an arbitrary title. I mean, if you want to really get down to the gritty of it. But what I specialize in is the language of our emotional body, the language of empathy, the emotional literacy that many of us are not taught growing up. It's something that is, I would say, sorely missing from our uh, formative education. And if you really wanted to break that down, I think the easiest way to describe it is I support people in learning to discern between what they're thinking, what they are reacting to, what's activated in their nervous system, for example, what they're perceiving as a threat, um, and what they're feeling. And I help people with communication around that, um, really helping them develop the language to express what's truly going on for them so that they can build more authenticity and more intimacy and also integrate bigger aspects of themselves into their lives. So that's kind of the core of what emotional intelligence work is. For me, I guess people probably, um, you know, I, I, it's not like a regulated title. So I imagine that there are people who offer different things that call themselves the same, but that's why, that's what I do. Yeah, thank you so much for enlightening us. Um, it's really, really nice having you here. And we were just talking a little bit and um, you were telling me about stillness. Yeah. And I know as, you know, being a high sensitive person, I know that stillness is something that makes me feel almost itchy. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> <laughs> What's your experience with your clients and, and um, why is stillness so important? Wow, I love that description. It's so true. <laughs> it also used to make me feel really itchy too. Um, so I will confirm that I, I think that that's probably a pretty common experience for a lot of people, especially in this day and age, as they say, where we have so much stimuli, so much uh, sensory input happening around us at all times that um, that true, you know, what, what some people might call inner peace, that true stillness that lives inside of our, of our bodies is so foreign that we don't even realize our tendency to just sort of pull things into our environment that distract us from that experience. And I work with overachievers who are really hungry for growth, really hungry for experience. Um, you may not be surprised to find out that I am also qualify as that type of person. <laughs> um, and, but who don't feel satiated by the experiences and the opportunities for growth that they have. So they're incredibly broad, you know, diverse, well-traveled, well-experienced in the world. And feel a little haunted by a sense of emptiness and you know that stillness thing that we were just talking about that can feel really itchy for a lot of people and so oh my god I have to do something about that um, and so my mantra as I also said to you before is the fastest way forward is inward and that is really a targeted thing for the types of people that I work with who are um, they're going places in life they can feel that they are they're successful they're um, you know, mature and they have these areas of their life that feel like voids or like gaps and don't know what to do about it because it doesn't fall into this category of being an overachiever person. And one of the things I just know to be really, really true, and this was also really true for myself, is, um, you know, when you're a person who is naturally gifted, for example, which is true of a lot of overachievers, a lot of people who are really highly perceptive, if you are confronted with something that it's not easy to do, you just create workarounds, you know, like you, you, you find a way to completely bypass it. And it's just, I think it's just a really common habit of people who are, who are extraordinary. I mean, everyone is, is actually extraordinary, but there are people who have to work a lot harder, who have developed work ethic in the face of challenge. And there are people who have had ease in their lives and then they learn to work around these challenges and particularly challenges around intimacy, around vulnerability, around authenticity, around 
being slow and not needing to be the number one person all the time, those are the types of um, growth edges that my clients are facing. And so I really am helping them reroute this linear direction approach to growth to being a more spherical, holistic, inward journey where they are really learning how to exalt their perceptivity, how to speak on behalf of and honor um, the experience that lives inside of their body rather than these external experiences that they've had, which tend to be bolstering their confidence. Um, so that's sort of a longer winded approach to, or answer to your question. No, it's a, uh, it's perfect. I, I really love um, what you're saying because when I look at my own clients, I actually see the exact same pattern, you know, working with artists that are often a level and all the time on the plane, hopping in the studio or performing or, uh, you know, um, playing a movie or, whatever it's all the time those stimuli around them mm -hmm. and a fast changing surrounding yes which or environment which makes it at those moments when there is a bit of time for them to relax and come to themselves which gives them almost like like we said that itch that you know you have to keep moving you have to keep doing stuff yeah because you know what i've noticed um, in the topic of being high sensitive and being empathic, like you uh, so beautifully put it as well, um, is that, you know, our brain has a deeper way of processing stimuli. Mm. And that makes that when we are all day thinking, thinking and, and switching, 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 and making sure that we're on our top game all the time, that when we don't have to be on our top game, our brain is still processing all of that yeah. and just has trouble finding that inner peace that you talked about. And that's so interesting because, and, and I completely recognize you know, it myself as well, because I do still have to train myself when I'm relaxing with my husband, for example, or even when we're watching a movie, we're still doing something but my mind is so freaking busy that it thinks that I have to be doing like 20 things um, to, be, to feel good while watching the movie. So it really tricks you in staying busy, even though watching a movie would already be doing something. Yes. So interesting and in how that's actually the thing that exhausts us and makes sure that we don't know what the inner core is anymore. We don't have uh, the sensitivity with our true self anymore. And that's why, you know, with artists, I often find that they, yeah, they, they lose touch with themselves and they start feeling quite lonely because they're always in their head and not actually present in the moment anymore. And I'm, Sure, like, you know, the highly gifted people, whether it's in creativity or it's, it's in rationality or it doesn't even matter, but that's what we do. We try to find little sideways, sideways to cope with that so that we can keep on going. But please do tell me, do you have like a certain way of working with people so that, you know, someone who's watching now can already start integrating your step that you would normally do with your client, for example? Uh, I do, and I wanna, I also wanna add something to what you just said, which I think is really important, is um, the, the word momentum. When you're talking about having momentum, it's really common for people who feel a lot to keep a high momentum because it's their way of outrunning emotionally charged experiences. And if you're a really, really highly sensitive person, if you identify as an empath where you're really impacted by moments of high sensation, like they knock you out, they make you tired, they make your thoughts real even more than they already were, you're gonna move really fast to try and avoid the influx of that because it, it feels overwhelming and then you start to feel helpless, paralyzed, 
and shut down. And so to the degree that you have the energy to, the rational decision, if you are missing the tools to be with moments of high sensation in a way that feel empowering is to just keep running. And I think that that's actually a really, really important thing to say, because it sounds like it's really relevant for your clients. I know it's relevant for mine. It was definitely relevant for me. It might also be relevant for you. We're in an all encompassing conversation here. Yeah. <laughs> it, and it's, it's so essential to recognize that, you know, for being as, as, as good as we are at a number of things that across the globe, regardless of what kind of person you are, whether you're an artist, whether you're a high performer, whether you're a low performer, chances are likely that at the core, you're missing the same skill set, which is a skill set that none of us were taught, which is how do you physically sit in your body with an experience that's highly sensational? The, the reason, like how trauma happens is an emotionally charged event occurs and it occurs outside of our um, ability to talk about it or our ability to feel safe within it. And what we then do as a coping mechanism is recreate neuro pathways to keep us out of those moments of high sensation as often as possible. And that's the, the wounding that actually is occurring. It's not the experience of high sensation, which is the wound. It's it's what we do to cope with the high sensation that is the wounding. It's the neuro pathway that we've created. And so, you know, I, I don't want to digress too much from the question that you asked, but I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle is that you can actually change and learn new skill sets and unlearn habitual behaviors to no longer feel threatened by slowing down. And so one of the things that I do with my clients, so this is a nice segue into the question that you just asked me, is um, one of the first things I do is I give them a list of, <clears throat> of feelings, like a, a, a non-exhaustive list of emotions that they can keep in their back pocket. There are feelings when your needs are satisfied, feelings when your needs are not satisfied. By the time we're adults, we usually know what most of those words mean, but in a moment of crisis, we can come up with good, bad, afraid, you know, probably angry, the, probably. angry yeah, <laughs> angry, frustrated, overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, but there's like, you know, hundreds of words to describe what we're feeling, especially in English. Um, I actually, you know, I, I'm trilingual and, and I find that English has the most words to describe how we feel. Danish has like a sixth of the words, which awesome. is really fascinating. Um, as I was learning Danish, I was very frustrated by the lack of vocabulary. Um, but you learn a lot about a culture when you learn that they don't have words to describe specific things. It's like in French, you say, je suis contente to describe being happy. But you also say, je suis contente to describe being excited. You know, like, je suis très contente. Like, I'm very content, you know. And in English, it's just like, I'm content is like the most neutral <laughs> response ever. And, and there are actually all of these other ways that you can learn how to describe, you know, both positive and more negative emotions. And so one of the first very, very basic things I do with every single one of my clients is I teach them um, how to say, right now I am feeling, insert a word from that list of feelings, and that's a perfectly right way to feel. And I wish I could take credit for this gorgeous and very, very simple and very life altering uh, exercise, but it actually comes from Mama Gina. So I wanna just like, you know, give her the, the credit that she deserves. It is a very, very potent exercise when um, the way most of us have learned to respond, like if you were to ask me, hey, Antisa, how are you feeling right now? A former version of me would have responded with telling you what I thought about something instead of how I felt or um, what I'm reacting to with blame instead of how I felt. And so there is so much potency in, like I was saying at the beginning, discerning between a feeling, a thought and a reaction because when we can get to the root which is the feeling and we can share without judgment without blame just how we're feeling and we can sit in that and live in that for you know two minutes it goes away it's incredibly potent work and it's such a simple solution but nobody's really taught that and so no and and more so 
we're taught that we cannot feel that we cannot be angry and it's bad if you're sad because you know then you're not strong and how often i hear clients and and i've struggled with this myself you know the thing that when you don't feel super strong or on your top game we feel weak yes and that's bad and the problem is that if you can't acknowledge it like you so beautifully put with this amazing exercise mm. if you don't acknowledge it and just and i'm so happy that you said like two minutes because that is enough but then there's the recognition in the fact that it's okay it's allowed and yeah. then it gets so much freedom and ease that it can just like flow away i mean for me, that's how it works. I teach my clients first, recognize the emotion. It's okay. Yes. It's okay that I feel angry. It's okay that I feel weak. And I'm still enough. You know, I'm still perfectly fine. I don't have to uh, run away from it. I just, you know, then you have the next step. What do I want to do with it? Probably. You have an amazing exercise or tip for us as well. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what you said. And it's, you know, it is so simple. And so the next step is, you know, right now I'm feeling, insert the feeling. That's a perfectly right way to feel. It's the same way as what you said. We have a really similar process there. Then the next step is, what am I telling myself that has me feel this way? What's the story? What's the narrative? Who am I blaming? And then, um, you know, I like Byron Katie or Lynn Forrest is another one, which I've, I uh, um, was mentored by Lynn Forrest for a couple of years. She's, um, she uses Byron Katie's work, but she also uses the drama triangle and universal law and some recovery aspects, which I think are really potent. Um, and so I, of course, use all those too, because she was my mentor, um, is, is to be able to say, um, is it possible that that story is false? Is it possible that there could be another reality here? And um, if you're willing to consider and place, instead of placing doubt on your own worth, but placing doubt on the narrative, it allows you to zoom out a little bit and say, hey, it's possible that I'm not seeing something here. It's possible that someone else's perspective um, might be totally different than mine because they're not operating through the lens of unhealed wounding, for example. And, and so I like to help people work with, and this is where I work with people's mindset is like, what's the story you're telling yourself? Does it feel good when you're telling yourself that? If it doesn't, you might want to consider changing your story, you know, like, and air it out, like give yourself an opportunity to claim that you're telling yourself a story that someone's just betrayed you. You're telling yourself a story that people don't want you to have what you want. And you have to actually work with your own belief systems. You have to actually be willing to consider that People are inherently good. They inherently want you to have what you want. They inherently love. Our default is authenticity. Our default is to try to do good in the world. And if you believe that, you have an entirely different experience of reality. And if you don't believe that, it's really easy to go down to the rabbit hole of despair very, very quickly. And that level of energetic hygiene is something that we're not taught and we're definitely not modeled in the world. Like, you know, you go to media and it's the rabbit hole of despair everywhere you turn, no matter where you are, you're on social media, you're watching a movie, like there's the, it's, it's so ingrained in us that we have to be almost rebellious to move ourselves out of that way of thinking because we've been socialized that that's the way things work. And so you have to learn how to put it in reverse, you know, <laughs> like, it's a skill set that we have to we all have to learn that yeah definitely i'm it's like i'm i'm hearing myself talk but in completely different words it's so funny yeah and the way i always say it to my clients is i compare it to a, you know those old record players where you put the the big records on and yeah. i say you know you have to listen which record is playing it's exactly what you say you know which record is playing and then you know, you ask yourself the question, is this record, is this tune serving me? Yeah. If it isn't, take it off <laughs> and start creating a new one. You know, it's it's really that easy. It is, I always say it is top sport, you know, it's the highest level. And mm -hmm. that's why why we as a coach have 
plenty of work because you know you don't learn this stuff by just trying it a bit at home it is it is like top league highest level and that's why why you know we love our job because we can really help people how they can learn to do this themselves but that perspective i i i really love how how you name it because i've had this client and um it's actually a musician and his art his manager said to said some things to him which hurt him you know he felt he reacted immediately on the defense because he felt that he got attacked you know he got he got a little bit of frustration in there and that had happened a few times so now a little explosion happened because he felt like really vulnerable and like he was being mocked at a little bit and afterwards we talked during the call and and then we start talking and while he was talking because he knew you know i just have to change the record and and see what that new record would look like and then he, he so beautiful he said himself yeah but i know that what he says is because he really wants the best for me and right there in that moment because we're going through it together you know but he's making those shifts in himself and in his thought process and in the in you know taking a little bit of distance, like you say, zooming out of the emotions and tapping into the bigger aspect, being everyone is here to love and to be loved and uh, to share their light. And it was so beautiful to hear him, you know, experience that transformation so quickly. And then the thing is that all the emotions that he was feeling regarding that conversation and regarding his manager they were just like dripping off it was like like the weight fell off his shoulders and he felt a lot freer and now he was at a point where he could you know get to his manager have an open conversation and not be be a conversation of frustration anymore but just of yeah how can we make this communication better because i do see you know your value and I feel that, you know, that way of communicating is not really working for me. So how can we, you know, meet each other in the middle? And then you get completely different conversations between people than when we have to react from emotion and being hurt ourselves. So it's super cool to hear you say the exact same thing, but just, yeah, and with different examples. So, yeah, I'm really happy uh, to hear that so please do tell us more what what else have you got for us on this <laughs> i love what you said um and, and this is a new metaphor for me which i may steal from you it's it's so much like a, a record a record and a record player and and i want to take it deeper because that's how our neural pathways work and when people talk about neuroplasticity one of the things they're talking about is it would be as though you took sandpaper to a record. And so, you know, records, the functionality of a record or a CD is that they have these, these grooves on them that, you know, work in a little spiral and it just, you know, you've, if you wanna change the track, you change to the next spiral and, uh, or the next groove, not the next spiral. Yeah. And our neural pathways work the same and, and they're like, we have habitual grooves. I, I, the, the the equivalent metaphor I use because I think it's so fun to just like build this out is um you know when you're when you're on a farm <laughs> I guess I grew up in the country like I'm not in the country <laughs> but in the forest and we had a wheelbarrow at home and and when you and we had horses and and so you you know would put the hay in the wheelbarrow and take it out to the horses and you do that enough times and guess what happens a rut gets created from the wheelbarrow and there's yeah. this single track ruck rut for the pathway that you take from the place where you store your hay to the place where you feed your horses. And in order for you, like, let's say, then you change pastures, you move the horses to a different pasture so that the pasture that uh, has not been used can be, you know, mowed by the horses and, and the pasture that has been used can recover from all of the traffic. So you need to take your wheelbarrow to a different pasture but it, the the rut is so deep at that point that you have to work really hard to get the wheelbarrow out of the rut 
and that is actually the sort of the resistance and the the constriction of changing those neuropathways and creating neuroplasticity in the brain is our ability to be able to change tracks freely. You've used this word a couple of times. I think it's a really important one. It's not that you go from one rut to another rut. And I think that this is why people are a little bit reluctant to change and, and create new processes in their lives is because there's this whole fear of this earlier form of them somehow disappearing. The, the reason you do that is actually to create agility and resilience. And it's, I would say it's equivalent to your, your metaphor is so great is to sanding down a record so that you can change tracks, you know, as easy as you change tracks on Spotify, instead of having to like pick something up and then, you know, find the beginning of the next song, which is what you used to have to do when you had a record player. It's to actually be liberated in your choice of how you want to show up and consciously being able to choose that from moment to moment. And of course, practices like meditation work really well for that because you can become more mindful in um, your moment to moment experiences and um, also life. You know, like this is the thing that I have to tell my clients a lot is like, we can have a really potent conversation that is actually in many ways very experiential because what I share is experiential for me. And so you're, you're getting a transmission of experience. You're not getting an intellectualized regurgitation that I've read in a book. And so the experience does live in the conversation, but it integrates in you taking that experience into your life and actually like, you know, ironing it in. And the, the, um, the most powerful way to grow quickly is to take um, these concepts as they live in you and apply them to your life and probably mess it up and then do it again. <laughs> and the next time you do it, you do it with more consciousness and then you can make these little tiny micro adjustments. And then the next time you do it, you make more micro adjustments. And then suddenly before you realize that you've made a macro adjustment in your life, you've sanded down that groove. And that is how transformation works. And in our, in our heads, before we've done any of this, we think it's like really going from black to white. And it's like, nope, there's like black. And then there's like, I will not say 50 shades of gray. <laughs> There are 50 gray. There we are with the desires again. <laughs> Not intentional at all, but here we are. Now I'm getting all flushed and embarrassed. Um, <laughs> there are all of those shades before you get to white. And incidentally, we're talking about light, like, you know. Maybe 50 shades of pink then. Just 50 shades of pink. pink. Yeah. <laughs> all of the colors of the rainbow, really. And, and you know, some of the most powerful um, transformational work you can do is to be in the middle of that old habitual response and to like hit the pause button in it. Be like, time out. I want to do this a different way. I know how this is going to end if I continue. Cause, cause it's a pattern. You know exactly how the song ends. Like I know how it's going to end if I continue business as usual here. I got to disrupt this. And I'm going to just, for the sake of research I'm going to try something different this time. Just to see what could possibly happen chances are likely it can't go any worse than the thing that's been driving you crazy your entire life most likely it's going to go better or it's going to be so different that you're going to find yourself in the very humble position of not having any idea what to do now and that's great news because when you don't know you can try kind of anything and chances are likely you're going to learn something you're going to create more intimacy with the people who are involved with you because when you bring two people together in the unknown, it's beautiful. I mean, like it is such a wonderful, delicious experience where two people come together and they trust one another enough to embark in the unknown together and be like, okay, where do you want to go next? You know, it's like going hiking without a map, you know, like the world is our oyster. We've got three days worth of food on our back. Which direction does your heart tell you you want to go? Let's find out. Maybe we hit a cliff and we have to turn back and we lose a day, but we're fine. And we know ultimately where the car is. Like it's, you know, it's really learning how to treat your life like research and like a laboratory, you know? Oh, I, I really love it. Yeah, you, you've put this so beautifully, Antesa. And 
I think this is the perfect way to to end our conversation because it's been so full and so rich. And maybe you have like one final tip or suggestion or mantra or quote or whatever that you would like to share with someone who's watching. Yes. So I like to say, why, why would you do any of this? And, you know, the, the spiritual masters of the world talk about inner peace. And going on this full in this rich journey of self-discovery, the reason we do that is to reach silence. It's to reach stillness. It's to reach regulation. We're very dysregulated in the world right now. Um, in our nervous systems, you know, we're stressed out. It, it, most people are really stressed out and it's getting worse. And ultimately we're all kind of looking for some respite from that, but we're stuck in these cycles. And one of the things that I have found to be so profound and so satiating, which for me, I'm looking for satiation. I want to feel my hunger um, the yearning, but I also don't want that to be constant, you know, then, then it becomes longing, like you're never going to get somewhere, but like, there is such satiation in emptiness, in liberation, in stillness, in silence. And what I have discovered in my own journey and what I feel so strongly about and what I try to lead others toward in themselves, in their own journey, in their own way, is how to find that doorway. Because when we have the keys, all of us have our own set of keys. And when you can figure out where that door is, the, the realization, it's a very humbling realization that like everything begins from there. It's not a destination. It's not an end point. It's not an outcome. There is a whole language that exists from silence. There's a whole world of awareness that exists within silence. There are new sensations within silence. When we're talking about people who are sensitive, when you can use your perceptivity for that, instead of the, the constant sort of incessant filtration of the five senses sensory input, that is for me, the ultimate liberation. It is wonder, it is awe, it's where curiosity lives. It's where authenticity lives. It's where integrity lives. It's where love lives. It's where God lives. And I am a huge advocate for us as humans learning to um, make space for that in our lives. So that's what I would love to end on. Wow, this is absolute gold. I've loved everything you've shared with us. And um, maybe I just want to add uh, from my part, a final small tip that if you are watching and you want to start this at home as well, but you know, just with the little things, then if you are watching TV, be mindful and watch TV. You know, don't be uh, on your phone, don't be in your head. When you're relaxing and you're on the sofa doing nothing or reading your book, then just be aware in the moment. When you are at dinner with the, the people you love, put the phone away, put the thoughts, you know, a little, tune it a little bit down and come back into the moment. And that's where you will find, like, like you've said it so beautifully, the freedom and the joy and the love. And it's by, by, you know, by being a lot more aware of what we do in those moments that will make us even more productive when we have to perform or, you know, work. But it, it also gives a lot more peace of mind it gives your stress levels a lot more time to recuperate, you know, so it will be just gold for everything that you still have to do by being present and just honestly enjoying the moment that you're having. You're sitting there anyway, so you can better take it on with both hands and just be fully in it. So that's what I would love to end this really beautifully inside scoop with today thank you so much for your amazing energy Antesa. i've really enjoyed it and 
I didn't know that you were a horse girl as well. So we still have a lot to talk about, I guess. But for now, <laughs> let's say bye-bye and we will stay definitely in touch. Thank See you. you.